Let's begin our time in a word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the beauty of creation and for the joy of assembling together, and for the presence of Christ, for the gift of your Son, our Savior and Lord. And in his precious and powerful name, we ask you now to pour out the Holy Spirit upon us, to illuminate our minds with the word of your truth, to enkindle our hearts with the fire of your holy love, but to empower us to go forth, to live out all that we've learned, to be informed, but to be transformed. So hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, as Kimberly mentioned, we've been hearing a lot about, well, fear, a, a pandemic of fear, but also how to cultivate a pure and holy fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. We're living in challenging times. We all recognize it, even the optimists among us. I should say both of you. <laughs> Kimberly and whoever else is so positive as she is. <laughs> you know, we do have six kids and our youngest just graduated from Franciscan in May and he is continuing to read. He just is a, a lover of books. I don't know exactly where he gets that from. <laughs> but he's really into Charles Dickens, and more recently, A Tale of Two Cities, which I think all of us know, at least the first line. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. And Dickens, of course, was not simply talking about, what, London and Paris, you know, or the French Revolution. He was describing what it's like to go through history. I'm reminded of a book that a good friend has recently published. Austin Roos has published a book, Under Siege. Perhaps you recall the movie from the 80s. But he says something like this. Let's face it, we're surrounded. We're outnumbered. We're outgunned. And we're infiltrated. So what must we conclude? that there has never been a better time to be a faithful Catholic. Are you serious? You really believe that? I do. I'd pass a polygraph. I'd get a high A. But it calls for a supernatural outlook and one that needs to be renewed continuously, at least for me. But we can take God at his word and we can especially do that if we come to know his word in sacred scripture. And we come to know his word in Jesus, the word made flesh, who did more than just fulfill every promise. He surpassed the highest hopes of the Hebrew people. He brought a fulfillment that went beyond their wildest dreams, and it will for us as well. But we need that supernatural outlook. You go back into the Old Testament, and as early as Genesis 32, there is this fratricidal feud, this rivalry between the two sons of Isaac, Jacob and Esau. And no wonder, because Jacob supplanted Esau. And so Jacob is trying to figure out a way to be reconciled with his own brother. And that's what Genesis 32 describes. And he is going with great fear because his older twin brother is stronger and more powerful. And so, what is he going to do? Well, 
in verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 32, he looks up and he sees angels of God. This is the army of God. And with that, he can go forth. Otherwise, he probably would have shrank back. And then, of course, he has in the second half of that chapter an all-night wrestling match, a mixed martial arts sort of thing with an angel. And he gets the blessing by the end. I mean, God does write straight with crooked lines back in Jacob's day, but also in ours. And likewise in Joshua's time. Here is Joshua crossing the Jordan with the second generation come of age, and what does he discover? Oops, we forgot one thing. None of them are circumcised. Now, I won't go into any details, I promise. Unfortunately, Scripture doesn't either. But they had to receive this covenant ritual which they had not received for 40 years in order to celebrate the Passover, and now we can get on with the conquest of the promised land. And then suddenly, this being appears before Joshua, and Joshua demands to know, are you on our side or on the other side? And this angel says, as commander of the armies of God, at which point Joshua rightly took off his sandals. And then he knew that the battle was the Lord's. And so the weapons would be spiritual, supernatural. And that's how he had that supernatural outlook. And continuously through salvation history, the Old Testament describes how Elijah, taken up in a chariot of fire, hands this blessing on to Elisha. And Elisha recognizes that God's people have become corrupt. They're infiltrated. They're surrounded. They're outnumbered. And so Elisha's servant is just cowering in fear. And so he prays, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And at once, Elisha's servant looked around, and above the mountains were these angelic armies and chariots that greatly outnumbered all of the Israelite enemies. That doesn't happen very often, but it's not just in the Old Testament. I like the The passage that we just read recently in the liturgy in Acts 12, the first of the 12 apostles was martyred by Herod. And so Peter was arrested and he looked to be next. He's in jail. He's in chains. He's surrounded. Middle of the night. Get up. Okay. Get dressed. Whatever. Follow me. And he does. And the chains fall off. The doors all open. And suddenly he finds himself out in the middle of the night, free. And then he says something. Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me. It's about time, Peter, (laughs) you know. So often we tend to forget that the Lord is with us more than we are with him. We affirm the real presence when we come before the blessed sacrament. But perhaps it's time for us to admit the virtual absence. That is me. I am there, but I am distracted. I am weary. I am sincere, but I'm also divided of heart. And so we've got to recognize that God loves us more than we love ourselves. He loves our loved ones more than we love them. And he calls us, he commands us to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. How does that work? Who else can do that? Since when can love be legislated? Well, really and truly, it can't be unless you happen to be the Lord God. And then suddenly, you don't just slip this, you know, bill into Congress and get it through. Of the 613 commandments that constitute the law of Moses, even the lawyer agreed with our Lord as to which of them was the greatest. Deuteronomy 6, 5, following the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Well, is it really fair, Lord, to legislate love, to command that? Oh, yeah. 
because he's loved us into existence out of nothing. He's loved us to the present day. And he who is faithful will get us all the way home and make us holy. And so it is only reasonable to respond with love. It is right and just. And I think we have to take God at his word. I'd like to just kind of create for a moment a narrative arc that would lead us from Luke 24 to the ascension. You remember Luke 24, it's my favorite story in all of the Bible. It's the Emmaus Road story. And I'm always tempted to start there, but I'm always finding it difficult to get out because the story is just so exciting for me. I get more out of it every year. Clopas and his companion are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's Easter Sunday, and remember, they meet up with an apparent stranger, and for some reason, they don't recognize him. He withholds his own identity, the risen Savior. And so he asks them what they're talking about, and of course, they say, are you the only one who doesn't know? Which is a good example of Luke's sense of humor, as well as Jesus. Is he the only one who doesn't know the things that have happened in this city? He is the only one who does know exactly what has happened and why and what difference it's going to make for the rest of all of history. But he plays along. What things? Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and the people. And they basically recount all that has happened because this was the single darkest week of their lives after this amazing grace-filled time that lasted days, weeks, months, years following Jesus. And at some point, you'd expect our Lord to say, time out, take a closer look. But he doesn't. He lets them go on until they're finally done as they re recount some women from our company who came back from the tomb with a vision of angels and said that he is raised. And at this point, you'd think he'd give them some comfort Hey, it's not as bad as you think. Cheer up. Trust me. But instead, he rebukes them. O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And suddenly, he begins to conduct this long Bible study that lasted for hours, mile after mile. And again, press pause and ask yourself, if you were the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and this was your first day back from the dead, how do you think you'd spend it? I mean, drop in on Pilate, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, you know, pyrotechnics, I'm back, and it's not looking good for you. I mean, we could come up with a list of at least 15 or 20 options, but I dare say that none of us would have on that list that my first day back from the dead as the risen Lord of Lords would be to spend a really long journey, spending hours leading a Bible study with Moses and the law and the prophets to show that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer all of these things before entering into his glory with two lowly people who don't even recognize me. You know, I am convinced, this is a, an aside, but I am convinced that quite possibly we have neglected one of the most wonderful attributes of God. God is all-powerful, omnipotent. He's all-knowing, omniscient. He's present everywhere, omnipresence. But I am convinced that we may be in for a surprise when we enter eternity to find out that he's also omnihumorous. <laughs> that a billion years of joy will pass by like a second and we'll realize that was the first minute of eternity. This is the divine comedy that goes beyond Dante. And so they just walk hours, mile after mile, and what are they feeling? Their hearts are burning, but they can't admit it until finally they arrive at the village. He, there at the table, he takes, blesses, breaks, and gives the bread, and finally their eyes are opened to the risen Savior, and finally Jesus says, it's about time. No, he doesn't. He vanishes. And this is a deliberate disclosure of the real presence of the risen Savior in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread, and so that departure was itself a way of teaching. And what do they do? They admit, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures? And it's a curious thing that Luke does. As he's opening the scriptures, 
And as he's breaking the bread, their eyes are opened. They go all the way back and get to Jerusalem. They find the 11 minus Thomas, and they recount what has happened. And I can just picture Peter listening, wondering why, wait, what's your name, Clopas? Okay. <laughs> and your friend, okay, and we were here the whole time, and you're telling us that Jesus chose to spend most of Easter Sunday with you. <laughs> Just saying, you know. And I could feel Clopas maybe getting defensive and saying, well, you know, maybe if you hadn't denied him three times, you know. <laughs> well, it wouldn't have taken me hours to recognize him even then, you know. This is an opportunity for, you know, these lay people like Clopas and the clergy, the hierarchy, our first pope to square off, but instead, it really is a kind of partnership where the laity who have seen the risen Lord just bear witness to the spiritual heartburn we had for hours until finally we recognized them in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. And this wasn't a flashback because Clopas and his friend weren't numbered among the 12. They weren't in the upper room, so it's not just a deja vu. Where else have we seen someone take, bless, break, and give? No, this is the unveiling of the real presence of the risen Savior in the Eucharist. And as these 10 disciples are trying to figure out what to do with it, suddenly who appears and leads the second lengthy Bible study of Easter Sunday? Our Lord. Clearly, he seems to prioritize the importance of knowing the Word of God more than many of us. Perhaps we should rethink our priorities. But it's not to make them Bible scholars. They weren't biblically illiterate. They knew, or at least they thought they knew, because they had kind of read Moses and the Law and the Prophets and the Psalms. But now that Christ was risen, it's almost essential to read the Scriptures backwards in order to see how it was intended from the beginning because we always tend to think, usually unconsciously, that what God has done through his son by the power of the spirit has to be plan B because of how badly we blew it. But what if just maybe this was plan A and we had to become utterly convinced that what Jesus says in John's gospel is true, that apart from me, you can do nothing. I mean, I can, I can do a lot of things. I, I, I teach, you know, I can clean the garage. <laughs> Don't ask. I can, though. <laughs> but no, we can't do anything supernatural. We can't do anything worth eternal life apart from him. But we don't really believe that until we're forced to. And that's what happens. And that's why the Old Testament is like a story in search of an ending. Because we usually think that God helps those who help themselves, right? That's in the Bible. No, that's Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> and so we have to recognize that God is not our co-pilot. He is the Lord. And so we have to learn how to live our lives in a new way. Well, let's trace that narrative arc from Easter Sunday to Ascension Thursday, because there we read in Matthew 28, verses 18, 19, and 20, all about what Jesus gives them as their marching orders, as our marching orders. And it isn't ambiguous. Verse 18 begins with this announcement, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. We've heard it so much, perhaps we haven't pondered it enough. Because, you know, when you step back and really look at it, upon closer analysis, it seems like a gross overstatement. All authority in heaven and earth will be given to you at the end of time, Lord, when you come back and it's no more Mr. Nice Guy and it's, you know, payback. But no, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth? Yep. That is the announcement as he proceeds to prepare them for his ascension because he's going to take the throne of the universe. Now, as the second person of the Godhead, Jesus has always been king and Lord, but now he has come down to take our humanity and he is going up to divinize our humanity, which is now his, and to make that accessible 
by the Holy Spirit through the sacraments, but especially in the blessed sacrament, the Eucharist. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Not will be, not most of it, but all of it. So what? Well, because of that announcement, the commandment comes next. And what is that? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Again, we've heard it. We call it the Great Commission. We think about it. And in my generation, I might describe it as the Great Omission. And why? Because listen carefully to what our Lord said to them. Go, therefore, and make disciples in all the nations. No, of all the nations. Now, the Greek term for nations there is ethne. We could translate that Gentiles. We could translate that ethnic groups. We could translate that communities because it isn't just the gargantuan secular nation states that we associate with the word nation today. In any case, what is he talking about? Go and make disciples of all nations? Yeah. And the word for disciple is interesting. Mathe taste, it comes from Montano, which means not just to kind of listen, not just to kind of learn, but to study to memorize, to follow the rabbi. As a disciple, it means to really allow your mind and your heart to be reconfigured. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Not just individuals within all nations, but if all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus, there isn't a single person on this planet Jesus doesn't point to and say, mine, you are mine. I bought you with my own blood. Right, Father? Yes, Son. There isn't a family. There isn't a neighborhood. There isn't a town. There isn't a state. All of this belongs to him. As one inner city pastor here in Steubenville said, he paid the cost to be the boss. Amen. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, which of course includes persons, married couples, families, and neighborhoods. But wow, the scope of the Great Commission eludes us because we don't even think that's within the realm of possibility. But it's not a suggestion. It's not merely a divine proposal. It's a commandment. And so it represents our marching orders. But is it reasonable? Come on now. As a man in the White House says, come on, man. <laughs> you think about that? I mean, it's a band of 12 now down to 11? You know, and you want to make disciples of all nations in the first century when the Roman Empire is in charge of most of the world, then you ought to choose the 12 from the Roman Senate, the most educated, the most eloquent, the most popular. Yeah. But no, you go to the backwaters of Palestine up to Galilee and you choose fishermen and tax collectors. Lord, with all due respect, what were you thinking? I suspect he knew. Because God always tends to prefer to do less with more, to get all the glory. And so, these 12, minus one, hear him say, go forth. What are the chances? Zilch. And yet, against all odds, what happened? Slowly but surely, like a pebble in the pond that sends out the ripples, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church, but especially the apostles. But that's not all, folks. The command is to make disciples of all nations, but how? Well, the promise is baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why is that a promise? Because we can't do it on our own. This is where hope comes in. Hope is desire for a difficult good. And eternal life is not just difficult, it's humanly impossible, but with God all things are possible, and with baptism, we are not just redeemed from sin. We're not just redeemed from hell. We're not just redeemed from everlasting condemnation. If that was all it was, that would be good news. But it's far better than that. We are redeemed for sonship, sharing Jesus' own sonship, for rebirth, regeneration through baptism that makes us children of God. More than our six kids are the children of Scott and Kimberly Hahn. Really and truly. 
So this pledge that our Lord gives shows us that the divine initiative didn't cease when Jesus ascends to heaven. And so baptism is the first of the seven sacraments, and that reminds us that the sacraments are the powerful things that God does to make up for what we lack, to give us all that we need. It doesn't make holiness automatic or easy, it makes it possible. And then comes the instruction, further instruction, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. Not just the natural moral law, not just the Ten Commandments, but whatsoever Jesus has commanded us. When you look at the Sermon on the Mount, turn the other cheek and love your enemy, it goes beyond the 613 commandments. So how is this burden easy? How is his yoke light? I mean, it just, well, apart from the Holy Spirit, this would be a council of despair. We would be hopeless. But because he's going to conclude by saying, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. And how is he with us? Through the Holy Spirit. And so Ascension Thursday sets into motion the first novena as the church waits with Our Lady in Jerusalem waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit to come down upon them, just as we need the power of the Holy Spirit to come down upon us. And then we go forth like they did. And against all odds, within three or four centuries, the Roman Empire, this ancient culture of death, corruption, moral relativism and violence becomes what even secular historians describe as Christendom. Read Tom Holland's book, Dominion. He's an agnostic historian who tries to explain to the people in woke culture that the very tradition you're canceling, you're cannibalizing. Without the Christian values of the last 2,000 years, this agnostic historian says, we wouldn't even have a comprehension of love. It's an exciting but challenging thing to recognize that God transformed the Roman Empire and made it Christendom. It was flawed, defective, never utopian to be sure, but it's what John Paul once referred to as an example of a civilization of love. I mean, we know that the Holy Roman Empire was not holy. It wasn't Roman. It was moved to Constantinople. All of those things we might have learned in public school. But the fact is, if God could do it back then against all odds, there's no reason for us to conclude that he can't do it again or that he doesn't want to. He wants to, and he commands us to. So I think it's time for us to reassess what we do in the Mass and the lines that we recite and we hear in every Eucharistic liturgy. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit, yeah. Lift up your hearts and we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And it is right and just. Dignum et justum est. Dignum. It is right. It is fitting. It is proper. It is our dignity. It isn't demeaning to give God praise. But it's not just right, it's just. And this isn't a lower form of justice. This is the highest and the hardest, but the greatest justice. You know, when we think of justice, we often reduce it to commutative justice, which is transactional. You pay for the groceries before you leave. We might think of distributive justice for the common good, what used to be called equity before that term was hijacked. And so, those are the two forms of justice, aren't they? No, there's another one. There is preeminent justice. Because if justice is giving to others what you owe them, then commutative justice means checking out, paying for your groceries. Distributive justice also means paying your taxes. And the speeding ticket, too, for that matter. And observing the laws from that point on, and these sorts of things that create for the common good, social harmony. But what about the debt we owe our parents? Can we ever pay them back by giving them life and love, food, clothing, shelter, and nurture? No, so what do we do? We honor our father and mother. And so right after the first three commandments in the 10, where we worship God and him alone, we don't take his name in vain, but with sincerity and integrity, and we keep the Lord's day, 
Then the next form of justice is to honor your parents. And no wonder. And this is the ancient virtue of pietas, piety. And likewise, honoring our elders, our rulers, those father and mother figures who lead us and guide us in the social order. But there's a higher form of justice. The highest form of justice, the preeminent forms of justice, is what Cicero called religio, to rebind ourselves to heaven, to the deity. And it wasn't just Cicero, it was Seneca, it wasn't just the Romans, it was the Greeks, it was Plato and Aristotle who recognized the fact that there is a form of justice, and remember that justice is the highest virtue. Well, we don't use that word virtue enough these days, and so what do we mean by virtue? Well, I mean, virtues are to the soul what muscles are to the body. Just as muscles make us strong so that we can do more and more good, more for more and more people, more and more easily, the virtues enable us to do that from the heart, with the mind and the will. And so it is right and just, which implies that it's wrong and unjust. It's a cosmic injustice to not give God thanks and praise. We owe him more than all of our parents put together, than all of the leaders that we have to obey. He is the source of our parents and our leaders as well as the grocery store and everything else. So religion as a form of justice is a virtue that even the pagans in ancient Greco-Roman times recognized. Augustine quotes them in the city of God. He purifies it because he warns of the danger of false religion, irreligion, idolatry, superstition, and all of that. And he shows that the city of God and the city of man are not two entirely different civilizations because one is religious and the other one's not, because the true religion has this unique power to form a civilization of love, and he traces it all the way back to Genesis, and then the city of man, which is defined by the love of self even to the contempt of God, is not without religion, but it's run by false religion, idolatry, where the rulers want to be worshipped. They might not say it in so many words, but you can tell by the way they wield power that they want to be regarded as the source of law. Well, once you identify the source of law and the standard of justice, ipso facto, you've identified the deity. It might be a false god, but as Dylan, Bob Dylan sang in his conversion days back in, nine, in the 70s, you got to serve somebody. Homo religiosa. That's what Augustine says. We're not just homo sapiens who seek wisdom. We are rational animals, as Aristotle said. We are social animals, but we are religious, homo liturgicus. We worship, either rightly or wrongly. And so to worship God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength is not only reasonable, it is right and just. But not to worship the one true God after he's given us his own son is not a misdemeanor. It's not a felony. It's a kind of capital offense with eternal consequences. And not because God is getting back at us. No, in time, in history, God punishes his people just like Kimberly and I punished our kids. We didn't punish the neighbor's kids even when they deserved it much more. <laughs> but they're not our kids. And so God does punish us, but not to get back at us, but to get us back to him. And so you can see in the biblical record of history how the punishments of God are intended to warn them and to draw them back to repentance, back to the family of God. And then, of course, God is an infinite respecter of persons, even when they misuse their freedom and they abuse it to the very end. And so, as C.S. Lewis said, the doors to hell are locked, but from the inside. They hate hell, but they'd hate heaven even more because that is the cumulative result of their decisions in pride and folly. So we've got to rethink some things here. Aquinas, building upon Augustine, citing Cicero, describes justice as the highest moral virtue, 
religion as the virtus virtutum, the virtue of virtues. What does he mean? Well, he's looking at history the same way the ancients did and recognizes the fact that religion has a unique capacity to form civilizations. In fact, if you look at the societies that become civilizations, according to historians, not only are they always with the religion, the religion is always front and center. Now, apart from Israel, almost all of them are false, idolatrous. And so the prophets have got to warn the people against those errors that come from the pit. Back then and there, but also here and now. And so we say these lines, but have we learned them? Or have we only learned them by rote? It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation. So it is right and just implies that it's wrong and unjust, and it's not a a minor injustice, but a massive one. But then the next pair is, it is our duty and our salvation. Well, which one is it? Is it our duty or our salvation? It's both. Why? Because God is fathering us as beloved sons and daughters, and even though we're prodigal sons and daughters, who are wayward and have wandered far off into wickedness, he wants to get us home more than we'll ever want to be home. And so it is our duty and our salvation. Once a week, no, always. Well, in the church, no, everywhere. Do you really believe it? It is right and just? It is our duty and our salvation? Always and everywhere? To give him thanks. Lord, (laughs) that sets it right. Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. And then as the prayer continues, which we've heard since we were little, in your case, if you're cradle Catholics, for the last 35 years, for me, we're described as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You haven't seen my parish, you know. Holy? Yeah, okay. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. I already mentioned it earlier today, that when we speak of the church as one, holy Catholic and apostolic church, we're not talking about the Roman Catholic church that is just simply on earth, global, planetary, international. No. The Catholic church is Catholic because it's universal. The head of the church is not the Pope. The head of the church is Christ, and he is in heaven. And the heart of the church is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the angels and saints don't form a higher and holier denomination. They are the primary members of the Catholic Church. And we are secondary members. We're the pilgrim church. We're called to be the militant church. So often, we're the somnolent church, sleeping. But the fact is, there aren't two churches, there's one. And it's united by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's holy because the saints and the angels in the presence of God live the life of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's one holy, it's Catholic, it's universal, and it's apostolic because the apostles aren't dead. They're alive in heaven, and they're more alive than we are, and they pray far better than we do And they're hoping that we would turn to them and ask them for prayers because they're truly our spiritual fathers and older brothers. And it isn't quaint imagery that we, you know, concoct on our own and project into heaven to kind of domesticate the the celestial realm. They're more of a family than the Hans could ever be. And this is who we are because this is who God is as our Father, sending his eternal son, to give us the spirit of sonship through the waters of baptism to be reborn. Again, we're not primarily redeemed from, we're redeemed for. It's one thing for Israel to come out of Egyptian bondage, but the exodus is primarily ordered to what you're going to find, and that is not just former slaves, but sons of God. You're going to worship the Lord. You're going to find out that this nation is now his family. But remember this, make disciples of all nations. God called Israel my firstborn son at the burning bush. Go tell Pharaoh, Moses, 
that Israel is my firstborn son. What does that imply about Egypt and all the other nations? They're younger siblings who have wandered off, and so God wants to groom Israel so that through his firstborn son, Jesus becoming man, he might make disciples of all nations, which means an international family. So this goes back to the Old Testament. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, we read in Psalm 33. But that isn't retired with the Old Testament. No, Jesus warns the Pharisees, I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation producing the fruits of it. And among the earliest nations, Ethiopia, the Armenians, even before Constantine was baptized. Now, I admit we don't really think this way. In fact, we tend to think that we shouldn't think this way. You know, or else our enemies are going to be confirmed in the suspicions that they have that you keep using the language of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that has social and cultural implications as well as moral and legal ones. Oh, no, no, it doesn't. No, this is just a private matter. Is it really? I mean, we are rational animals. We've got to love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But we're also social animals. And so the catechism is very clear on this. It says, and I quote from 2105, the duty of offering God genuine worship concerns man both individually and socially. This is the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies toward the true religion and the one church of Christ. Now you wouldn't begin the sentence, this is the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies, unless the ones framing the catechism were well aware of the fact that many Catholics throughout the world have forgotten or denied or wandered away from the traditional Catholic teaching on the moral duty of individuals and societies toward the true religion and the one church of Christ. So how do we do that? We take up arms? No. But we receive the power of the Holy Spirit. We go forth to make disciples of all nations. The next sentence, by constantly evangelizing people, the church works toward enabling them to infuse the Christian spirit into the mentality and mores, laws, and structures of the communities in which they live. Just like Vatican II called lay people not only to the universal call to holiness to become saints, but also to sanctify the temporal order, not just to clean it up, not just to sanitize it, not just to create a legion of decency for everyone who makes another movie, although that would be nice. The social duty of Christians is to respect and awaken in each person the love of the true and the good. It requires them to make known the worship of the one true religion which subsists in the Catholic and apostolic church. Christians are called to be the light of the world. Thus the church shows forth the kingship of Christ over all creation and in particular over human societies. There is religious freedom for other people, non-Christians, but it is not unlimited. And so we have an opportunity. No, we've got an obligation. We've got a privilege to go share the gospel and yet, and yet, I'm not sure we really want to. It reminds me of what happened back in August of 1974 when these two Swedes invaded a bank in Stockholm and they took four hostages in the vault. They held them for five days until finally the prime minister reluctantly sent in, the, sent in force and they used tear gas and they, they took these two captors. They took, I'm sorry, they, they, they took the two robbers who were holding these hostages. And then a strange thing happened. And that is the hostages were upset with the police. Not because they were injured, they weren't. And in the trial, they not only spoke out in defense of the robbers, their captors, they tried to help raise money for their legal defense. Why? No one knew. And so psychologists studied this incident, and that's how the Stockholm Syndrome entered the American vocabulary. Because sometimes you internalize the values of your captors as a coping mechanism, as a way of dealing with this stress that lasts for hours, for a day, and then for days. And either you're going to be humble and admit the fear, or you're going to internalize their values, and suddenly everything is inverted. 
And I would suggest that there may be a spiritual Stockholm syndrome, that we have internalized the values of a secularized culture that wants to privatize religion. It considers the voicing of religious belief in the public square. Religion is irrelevant. In fact, it's dangerous if you appeal to that in any kind of public context. Well, Dr. Mary Healy last night disabused us of that with the examples of the apostles, and we have the martyrs. And so we have not just the opportunity, but the obligation, the privilege as well. You know, I'm not saying that every single Catholic is, you know, a victim of the Stockholm Syndrome, but I would say that as American Catholics, we forget that we have dual citizenship. Like Paul reminds the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. He's not asking the Philippian believers to renounce their citizenship in Philippi. He's just reminding them that they have a temporal and eternal, a human and a divine citizenship, as American Catholics do too. And so we have obligations toward our country, patriotism, gratitude, and all of the respect we owe our leaders. And at the same time, we recognize that Christ is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And it's not just ethereal, otherworldly, or at the end of time. People say, yeah, but Jesus said my kingship is not in this world. He didn't say that. In John 18, 36, he says, my kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight that I not be handed over. But my kingship is not of this world means it's not a majority vote. It's not the power of the emperor, Caesar. No. Pilate says, so you are a king. You say I'm a king. For this I was born. For this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate asks a question which is really not a question, but the cynical voice of many politicians down through the ages, what is truth? What is truth when you've got power, when you've got money, when you've got the Caesar backing you? Well, truth is the essence of reality. And so we've got that on our side, even if we have people who deny the notion of reality, objective truth, and say that's hate speech, especially if it ventures into the moral realm. But it's not rude, it's not un-American, it's not wrong, it's not inappropriate. Oh, banish this illicit thought of bringing Christ. Well, it's not going to be by force, but it will be by faith, hope, and love. To withhold the faith from a neighbor because you think it might alienate him is not an expression of respect or friendship. It's a betrayal of friendship. To say, well, I want holiness for myself is good, but not if you add, well, not for my spouse. That's up to her. Well, you want it because it's holy matrimony. Yes, I want it for me, for my wife, but not for our kids. No, we want it for our kids, but not the neighbor's kids. No, we want it for the neighborhood, but not the city of Steubenville. No, we want it for the city, but not Ohio. No, we want it for our state, but forget the other 49. We want it for all 50 states, for the entire nation, but not the others. We want to make America great, but no other one else. We want to make every nation holy starting with ourselves, our families, our neighborhood, our parish, our town, where does Jesus draw the line and say, oh, not that far. I didn't die for them. And so we've got to rethink this. This is what John Paul was calling for, the new evangelization that will lead to a civilization of love because the true religion not only has the power to form a civilization of love like no other religion, it has something even more and that is the power to form saints. The power to do things for us that we can't do for ourselves, such as happened on May 21st of this year, when I saw my son, our son Jeremiah, get ordained to the priesthood for the Diocese of Steubenville by Bishop Montfort and laying his hands upon our son. Our son! <laughs> It was long awaited, it was well attended, but I mean, it was special, special, it was surreal. You know, the line formed for people to get blessed by our son, the priest, Father Jeremiah. 
I'm the father, I'm the breadwinner. But even if I speak the words of consecration at the dinner table, it's still bread. I watched, we all did, as our bishop in the line of apostolic succession knelt to get blessed by this newly ordained son of ours who's now our sacramental father. And then the line formed, it got long and eventually it came down to Kimberly and me and we were not dry-eyed, I assure you. And within the next day, we see him say his first mass, the words of consecration, just who do you think you are, son? I mean, you're a mortal man, you're our son. You think you can turn earthly matter into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the God-man, the creator and the redeemer of the heavens and the earth? Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay. To God be the glory. I mean, this doesn't just call for Eucharistic faith. This doesn't just call for Eucharistic devotion. This calls for Eucharistic amazement, as Pope John Paul said in his last encyclical back in 03, the Church of the Eucharist. It's amazing how unamazed we are. I honestly believe that the Eucharist is far more unbelievable than we let ourselves believe. There is no way it can be true. Unless, of course, it is. And then it's amazing how unamazed we are. And not just the words of consecration, but the words of absolution. The line formed on our back porch. His niece, our nieces and nephews, his cousins, he heard their confession. And then Kimberly's turn and mine. And what a good confessor he was to give us the comfort and the encouragement, but above all, the words of absolution. Our priests become our fathers in the family of God. They raised the dead more than Jesus raised Lazarus. He just gave him his body back for a few more years. God the Father, through Christ, by the Spirit, raises us up to divine life, eternal life. That is the real resurrection. The priesthood, the words of consecration, the words of absolution, the real presence, transubstantiation. We are so accustomed to these ideas, these truths, these realities that we don't always see how truly fantastic they are. <laughs> but they're real, they're true, they're beautiful, they're powerful. It's what makes us sons and daughters of God. It's what will make us saints. And believe me, it is right and just. It is our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give him thanks and praise. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, our words fall short when it comes to expressing our thanksgiving, our praise. For you excel all creation by fashioning the universe. You excel all all the other gods, the false deities, by the truth of your love, by the justice of your law. And worship as a command performance for us is our duty, but it is our salvation, it is our dignity, because by it you get nothing out of it, but you fill us with all of your very life. Forgive us for taking so much grace for granted, dear Father. Help us to make up for lost time for the rest of our lives in our, in our prayer, in our own homes, in our neighborhoods, our states and nations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. There's never been a better time to be a faithful Catholic. God bless you, brothers and sisters.